It's the Q. Here is your host, Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Frick here with the Q. We're on the ground in Santa Clara, California at the Open Daylight Foundation event, their second event. Uh, the foundation's been around for, for, I think, three years. This is their second event. And we're excited uh, for this next segment. Jay Etchings, Director of Research Computing from Arizona State University. Welcome. Certainly. Well, thank you. Absolutely. So, research computing. What is research computing? So, what research computing is at Arizona State University is it's an amalgamation of uh, two sciences, one high computational or high performance computing and data intensive computing or big data put together under one offering. And what, how do you delineate the two? One is really more just computational intensive versus all the data or? So the traditional approach to high performance computing is bare metal machines that do high computation for uh, life sciences, for uh, weather forecasting and all the traditional physics domains. Uh, big data or data intensive computing is something recently adopted in higher ed and the National Science Foundation, which is what you think it is. It's Hadoop, it's uh, big data analysis, it's analytics uh, that fits in with our business school, that fits in with life sciences. All right, we're and, live, and, things happen. <laughs> and, uh, and several other things. So uh, these two were completely separate before the research computing initiative came along and put them together, put them both on the same fabric so jobs can go from one to the other. Right. Okay, excellent. And so what are you doing here? What's your, what's your role here at Open Daylight? So my, I've been with the university for about two years, but my appointment to director over research computing only came about in the past eight months. Uh, at that time, we had a multiplicity of controllers. So we had Cumulus, we had some NEC stuff. Everybody had their own, and we were looking for some way to unify them. And Open Daylight gave us the, the methodology to do that, to get everything together, get everybody developing on the same path. So. So before we went on air, you were talking about open source and open stack and open networking and open compute project, and we, we cover a lot of these shows. Sure. Talk about the impact of, of open and all these different initiatives on innovation and what you guys are able to do at the university. So, so one of the foundations that President Crow is trying to, to reach for, and one of his key goals was to extend higher ed to all Arizonans. And to do that, we have to be able to extend research computing to all Arizonans. Well, uh, as a publicly funded university, we have to do a fair share of that on our own. So the, the open methodology allows us to interoperate with all sorts of different universities, some of different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, without the high price of licensing and proprietary and, and inter operability with applications. So uh, everything that we can do open, we do, and we try to build a supported model around it so then we can put it into production. Okay, and then what about in terms of being uh, really active participants in these foundations? How much are you guys contributing code back? Are you really active or are you just kind of taking advantage of it? So we're definitely taking advantage of it. I mean, that's that, that's the ultimate goal. Uh, but we're on the customer advisory board for Open Daylight. We okay. contribute code back to the Viata project, which is an Open Daylight controller that uh, Brocade sponsors. Uh, and we work pretty closely with our computer science division uh, to develop these projects. And we also, quite honestly, are looking for funding opportunities. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, NSF funded uh, network opportunities or Department of Energy funded network opportunities where we can build an application and then pass it back and, and get some funding and support for those those types of things. So. Right, so we talked a little bit about some of the things you're working on. So you, you mentioned FlowGuard. What is FlowGuard all about? What are you guys doing? So FlowGuard is uh, an open flow based firewall that we were using for uh, uh, host protection or endpoint protection. Uh, the current initiative is around obviously distributing that firewall so all the devices that are in that flow path can understand uh, when a state change occurs or when there's an indirect violation versus kind of the uh, nomenclature around firewall methodology that only uh, sees direct violations to policies. So this can um, look for state field changes and, and know to adapt to them within the, the firewall architecture. So um, a good, big component of that is really this uh, NFV that's emerging out of this mo movement as well that allows us to have a firewall that sits in on all these different appliances. Right. But, uh, but really one of the growing uh, kind of constructs is this perimeter security, right? So the, the, the concept of sure. a firewall Where's the firewall when everyone's running around with their own with their own devices that nobody's got control over and they're sure. accessing all these applications sure. and then that's before we talk about Dropbox and 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 all the you know yeah. kind of whole host of 
of uh, shadow IT things that aren't spinning up an Amazon instance, but sure. you know, taking notes in the meeting on, on Evernote. Um, how does that play, I mean, in, in terms of really thinking about security and putting in systems that, that can you know, meet the standard that they need to meet? Well, so first you got to take a step back and look at uh, some of the nomenclature and, and, and who's defined it and who's driving it because no matter what we come out with, uh, for every term that comes out, whether it be cloud or even back to voice over IP or even the, the things that happened around SIP, uh, vendors adopt these things and then they apply their own definitions to them and that's how they sell them in the marketplace, right? So when we talk about firewalls, uh, we're still kind of talking about uh, uh, traditional perimeter protection, but it's also hybridized with an IPS component or uh, uh, a secondary UTM component. So if you if you're looking at that uh, that architecture and what it looks like, so there's perimeter defense, but there's also uh, some inside detection, and then there's an action that happens tertiary to that, and then that action is sent off to the expert who might be the UTM device or where secondary deep inspection could occur because we understand putting a firewall or putting some sort of IPS device on everything, similar to how we tried with desktops years ago and it sucked up a whole bunch of resources, that's not possible in, in network equipment. So, uh, so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, we're just trying to take the existing components and make them interoperate uh, more efficiently. Right, and then watch out, here comes Internet of Things, right? So there's yep, going to be sure, IP enabled sure. devices connected all over the place. Yep. A whole new challenge. University is filled with that. Uh, Eighty-two thousand students. Um, so, biggest university in, in the U.S. Right. Eighty-two thousand students. Yes. yes. Uh, you, ASU is a really big school. Uh, <laughs> so, with a funding goal of you know seven hundred million uh, by twenty twenty, uh, and a, being a research one university. We, we're measured by who, uh, not by who we exclude, but by who we include. So we have everybody come, they all bring their three devices, their, their iPad, their phone, their, uh, uh, their laptop, and, and what we've been trying to do through our BI team is establish ways to, to allow them to interoperate with all these environments, but do it in a safe way. And, and that challenge in itself opens up a whole bunch of new doors. Uh, not only that, but we offer Internet 2 access on the research education network as well. So uh, we have a science DMZ where there is no perimeter security. Right? Uh, it's friction free to 100 gig and, and we use that for our specific for, the, for those research groups. And, and that's a place where the, the talk about how a perimeter firewall doesn't fit anymore uh, brings up a great discussion. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you uh, got your hands full. We definitely do, and, and this summer, I'm surprised I made it here today because uh, uh, this summer we're really heads down trying to knock out a lot of these tasks, so the beginning of the semester we'll be ready for the students, but I'm sure they'll, they'll throw up some stuff we don't expect. 89,000, right. that's a lot of yeah. people. A lot yep. of things, people are things too, right? That's a lot of devices, that's <laughs> a lot of things, C certainly. Absolutely. Certainly. All right, Jay, well thanks for taking a few minutes to stop by. Thank you. Good luck uh, in the semester, uh, go right. Sun Devils. Go Sun Devils. All right, Jay Etchings here, I'm Jeff Frick, you're watching theCUBE, we're at the Open Daylight Summit, thanks for watching.